So hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Kuo. I'm software engineer at Google and co-chair of this conference. And I'm also the project maintainer of Kubernetes. So today, it's very nice to be here to give you an, an update on Kubernetes. So the other day, I was browsing through my social media. And some of my friends are sharing their memories. Memories is a feature on social media that you can get your live events or moments, big moments, to reflect on. So one of my friends shared that she uh, had her first job three years ago. And another friend moved into a new city last year. So I started wondering, what if Kubernetes were a person? What would Kubernetes memories look like? So today, in celebration of Kubernetes' five-year anniversary, let's have a look back at Kubernetes. 16 years ago, in 2003, Google created Borg. Most of you should know that Borg is the predecessor of Kubernetes. Um, Borg is Google's cluster manager. It supports uh, high availability applications and it achieves high utilization. Today, Google, uh, Borg is still Google's primary cluster management system because of its scale and robustness. Then in 2003, the Borg developers, they introduced process containers because managing processes couldn't scale. And process containers is what we know today as C groups. And C groups became the foundation of container technology. And then in 2008, Linux containers adopted the container terminology. Linux containers is what Docker was built upon. Then 10 years ago in 2009, Google created Omega Project with a desire to improve the Borg ecosystem. And a lot of Omega primitives eventually made their way into Kubernetes. For example, the scheduling unit eventually became the pods in Kubernetes. And then some other examples are forgiveness, and disruptions, tens, and tolerations. Now, let's fast forward to six years ago in 2013. Docker was open sourced by the cloud. Docker has done a great job of making it super easy to run, configure, and share containers on a single host. And the next step, is to make it very easy to configure and coordinate containers across multiple hosts. So we need a great uh, cluster management system, something like Borg. So with that in mind, by the end of 2013, Project 7 was proposed in Google to create an open source cluster um, management system, a container orchestrator and to help lay the foundation of future cloud. You may wonder what's about the name of Project 7. It can actually come from a Star Trek character, Seven of Nine, who is a very friendly board. Somebody get the joke. <laughs> and that's why Kubernetes logo has seven sides. And then in 2014, Google announced uh, Kubernetes at DockerCon. And many other companies, such as Red Hat, Docker, CoreOS, and a lot of other companies quickly joined the community. And then we had our first contributor summit. 2015 was the year that I started contributing to Kubernetes. Then Kubernetes 1.0 was, was released, and CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, was formed. And by the end of 2015, 
we had our very first KubeCon in San Francisco. Then in 2016, we had our first uh, SIG. SIG is Special Interest Group. It's an open group that the developers can own and develop subprojects of Kubernetes. And then the contributors can collaborate and communicate in a very transparent way. Later this year, we had our first European KubeCon in London. And then we start getting industry adoptions, and we see more people running Kubernetes in production at scale. And two years ago, in 2017, the custom resource definition API, or many people call it CRD, was introduced. CRD is a feature that allows you to define your own Kubernetes-style API. So it's, a, it's now a very popular way for people to extend, customize, and build things on top of Kubernetes. Some other important Kubernetes primitives, such as RBAC and Workloads APIs, also went GA in this year. Many cloud providers announced native support for Kubernetes. And since then, it's safe to say that Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for can container orchestration. And just last year, Kubernetes was the first project to graduate from CNCF incubation. And we expand KubeCon to just another continent. We had our first KubeCon in Asia. So today, Kubernetes is already one of the highest velocity open source projects, compared to over 100 million projects on GitHub. Kubernetes is number two by the number of pull requests. And guess who's number one? It's Linux. And Kubernetes is number four by the number of issues and authors. And Kubernetes now has over 31,000 contributors. And that's a, an amazing number. And you, if you are one of them, please stand up. And let's give them a round of applause and thank them for their contributions. And the total number of commits and contributions has risen by four times since Kubernetes joined CNCF. Many global organizations are using Kubernetes in production at massive scale. Kubernetes adoption spans multiple industries, including e-commerce, uh, retail, gaming, IoT, AI, banking, social media. You, there's a lot more. And the, from the Kubernetes look back, you know that Kubernetes wasn't an overnight success. It's an over-decade success. And here we are at the, one of the biggest open source developer conferences ever, celebrating Kubernetes' five-year anniversary. At this age, Kubernetes is getting very stable and mature. The latest Kubernetes release, 114, has more uh, enhancements moving to stable than ever. So for example, out of 31 enhancements, 10 are moving to stable. The first key feature that's moving to stable is uh, production supports for Windows nodes. Enterprises can now manage both Windows-based and Linux-based applications in a single orchestrator, and that is Kubernetes. This means better operational efficiencies. Uh, local persistent volume is another important feature that's going to stable. So for in-cloud, if you're running distributed file systems or databases, it gives you better performance 
for using local SSDs rather than remote disks. It's also cheaper if you are using local storage on-prem. This is a huge improvement for running C4 workloads in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is mature. But mature doesn't mean that we stop innovating. So what's next for Kubernetes? Here's my prediction. First, as Kubernetes matures, the next step and focus in the community will be around extensibility. We already see a lot of um, platforms and open framework are being created on top of Kubernetes, and I expect there to be more in the next few years. Some of the Kubernetes extensibility, uh, extensibility features around and it's not um, stable yet. For example, CRD is still beta. And compared to the built-in Kubernetes APIs, there are still some missing pieces, for example, uh, versioning and validation. So I expect the Kubernetes uh, extensibility features to continue involved and eventually mature. The second focus is around scalability. Kubernetes scalability is not a single number. It's not like running 5,000 nodes in a cluster. It's a combination of the number of nodes, number of pods, namespaces, secrets, and services, and many, many things you run in your cluster. It's actually a multi-dimensional problem. And sometimes the dimensions are not independent. And when you fix one bottleneck, you usually just expose the next one. Let's take a real issue as an example. In Kubernetes, to quickly discover uh, problems in nodes and, and recover those, react to them, we need frequent and periodic signals from nodes. However, node status updates are very expensive. It's updated by kubelet every 10 seconds. And every time the status is updated, the full nodes uh, the full node object will be stored in SCD, even though uh, the node status hasn't changed at all. So for a 5,000 node cluster, that means um, 300 to 600 megabytes per minute in, a, in SCD. And this often overloads SCD. And to solve this, we introduce a new API called node lease. So kubelet refreshes lease with the same frequency, but as a lighter weight signal for node uh, healthiness. So improvement in scalability need real world use cases. And it often requires changes to a broad surface area across multiple SIGs. And scalability improvement is forever. Our last focus is reliability. For example, fixing cascading failure holistically. When the user is reporting that the node is being killed and the whole cluster is down, this is known as a cascading failure. An issue we saw in the past is that when a bad pod is crash looping, if it's doing it very, very fast, the crash dump and the logs will eventually fill up the local disks on the node and then eventually cause the node to fail. When the bad pod is killed, the workload controller will quickly react to that and try to recreate those bad pods and schedule them to other nodes. This causes problems with other nodes. And then nodes will start DDoSing the API server, and eventually the whole cluster is down. So how do we solve this? Currently, we work around it by not making the workload controllers to think that they had to recreate those pods. 
Instead, we just put those bad pods in the waiting states, let them sit in the nodes so that the workload controller will not try to recreate them. But then it hides useful signal. This is an example of Kubernetes reliability that multiple SIGs need to work together to improve instead of having everyone to rediscover the same problem over and over, and everyone just try to use their own way to work around it in similar or different ways, which might have unfortunate consequences in other contexts. So to sum up, Kubernetes is stable and mature. And the next focus is on extensibility, scalability, and reliability. We need to keep improving Kubernetes, and we need to do it together as a community, whether it's direct contributions to Kubernetes, or new frameworks built on top of Kubernetes, or built in the ecosystem, or upstreaming your internal tools or fix for everyone to use, or just share some real-world success or failure stories so that everyone can learn from. So from today's uh, morning keynotes, you know that how important it is to contribute to Kubernetes. So I hope everyone can contribute. And thank you.